this video, I'm gonna be covering inverse proportion with you. Now, if you haven't watched the one on direct proportion before this, you should definitely go and watch that because it's gonna have lots of the same ideas. So we did in direct proportion, we talked about the speed of a car and we talked about the distance that it was traveling. This time I'm gonna talk about the speed of a car and the time taken for it to travel a fixed distance. I'm gonna try and fill in this table that we've got here. So for inverse proportion, sorry, for direct proportion, we said that if you doubled the speed, you would double the distance. Let's see what the relationship will be with the speed and the time taken. Well, if you double the speed, so in this case, we were doubling the speed from five to 10, Think about what happened to the amount of time that it would take, mainly remembering you're going for a fixed distance. Well, actually, you would half the amount of time. You would say that if you were taking uh, going twice as fast, you should be taking half the amount of time. And similarly, we can think if this car was traveling five times faster, it should take five times less amount of time. And 100 divided by five is 20. You can spot some of these other patterns, that if it's going from 10 to 30, if that car is traveling three times faster, that time should also divide by three. Now, 50 divided by three, I can either write it as 50 divided by three, or I could actually calculate what that's going to be. And if I do 50 divided by three, I've got that it is 16.67 seconds. And this is an interesting one. Think to yourself, if the car was not traveling at all, how long would it take to travel a particular fixed distance? Well, if it's not moving, it's gonna take an infinite amount. It's never ever gonna get there. So I'm not even gonna really write infinity. I'm actually just gonna say it wouldn't get there. It, wouldn't, it would be undefined how long it would take for it to travel that fixed distance because of the fact it's not even moving at all. Now I'm wondering if you can spot any relationship between these two things that we've got here. The relationship between these two things that we've got here is a little bit different. It's actually gonna be linked to something that we have on this side. So think to yourself what this relationship might be between these things that we've got. Okay, so we say instead for inverse proportion that the speed is proportional to one over the time that the speed is proportional to one over the time. This bit in the middle means it's proportional to, and this one over t, this means inversely proportional. The other way that we write this is instead of it being k multiplied by t, like it was with direct proportion, it is k divided by t, where k is the constant of proportionality. So we say that speed equals k over t. And we're gonna think in our example, what is the speed equal to? Well, it looks like something divided by this. And the thing I asked you about earlier, what's this relationship between these things, is they all multiply to give the same thing. If you did five times 100, you get 500. If you do 10 times 50, you get 500. If you do 25 times 20, you get 500. It works with all of them. So the thing that we're dividing by in this case is 500. If I do 500 and I divide it by the time, I get the speed. 500 divided by 50 is 10. 500 divided by 20 is 25. So in our example, the speed is equal to 500 divided by the time. So in our case, the constant of proportionality was 500. Now you might be thinking to yourself, this fixed distance that we had in the question, I wonder what that fixed distance is. That fixed distance is the 500 meters that it's traveling. So if something is going for 500 meters and it takes 100 seconds, it must have been traveling at five meters per second. So if it's inversely proportional, meaning that in, when you multiply something by two, you divide it by two for the other variable, it means that you would write it as this particular thing here. Now I showed you a graph of these things before. I have got along the bottom of this graph, I have got the speeds of the car, and along the side, I've got the time that it's taking. So if it was traveling at five meters per second, it would take 100 seconds, that's what we wrote here. You can see 10 and 50, 25 and 20, 30 and the 16.667. And this relationship that they have is this kind of strange curve, okay? This is what we call a reciprocal curve. And it's a reciprocal because we have this one over sort of feature, we have this one over t, that's why it's called a reciprocal curve. And this reciprocal curve has some interesting properties. When we said that there was, uh, the car was traveling at zero meters per second, that it would take, there was no amount of time that it would take. So 
it's almost like infinite. That line is never going to get to zero. It just keeps going up and up and up. It's actually something that we call an asymptote. And the same thing, if you made the car travel really, 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 really fast, it's never, ever going to say that it takes zero seconds. So even if you make the car travel really fast, the time taken is never going to be zero, which is why we get this pattern of this curve that looks like this, where it never reaches this axis, and it also never reaches this axis either. So this is what we would call like a reciprocal graph, and reciprocal graphs have this pattern where they look like this. Okay, so let's have a quick think about how we can do the first line of working for some of these different things. So we're going to do a mixture of direct and inverse here. It says if y is directly proportional to x, we know that we just write y equals kx. If it's inversely proportional, instead of it being k multiplied by x, it's k divided by x. It says inversely proportional to the cube of x. So it's definitely going to be a k over, and it says the cube of x, so that's x cubed. It says y is proportional. It doesn't have to say the word directly. y is proportional to the cube root of x. So it would look like this. y is inversely proportional to the square root of x. And y is proportional to the square of x. So the ones that say inverse have it like a fraction. The ones that say direct or just proportional have it like a multiplication instead. So I'm going to do these two examples, and then you're going to try two yourself, and that's everything to do with inverse proportion. So in this question, it says y is inversely proportional to x. So I'm going to immediately write down that y is equal to k over x. If you wanted to, you could say y equals y, sorry, y is proportional to 1 over x, but that's not essential that you have, but you should recognize what that means. So it wants us to find a formula for y in terms of x. To find a formula, this thing here literally just means find out what k is equal to. Now, y is 3 and x is 12. So I'm going to replace the y with a 3 and I'm going to replace the x with a 12. So to find out what k is equal to, I do the opposite of divide by 12, which is multiply by 12. So I'll do 3 times 12 to find out what k is which means that k is 36. So my formula for y in terms of x is this thing that I have. It is going to be y equals 36 divided by x. Part two of the question says find y when x equals 5. So I'm just going to replace the x with a 5, so I'll do 36 divided by 5. You could either do that on a non-calculator method, but I'm going to be lazy and I'll do 36 divided by 5. So y is equal to 7.2. Part three of the question says find x when y equals six. So thinking about this formula, I'm going to say that y is equal to six. And sorry, this formula that I've got here, in fact. And we're going to find out what x is equal to. Now, what you could do is just think, OK, well, 36 divided by something is six. Ah, x must be equal to six. But that's not going to be as easy for certain numbers. So we're going to try this other process for this. I'm just going to shift this up a, a line so that I have a little bit more space. The way I solve these equations is I would multiply up by the x so that I get 6x equals 36. And then to get the x by itself, I would divide by the 6. So x is equal to 36 divided by 6 which is just 6. But I want you to spot something. I want you to see what's happened to this 6, which was here, and this x that was here. We've now moved the x up here and the 6 down here. So these two things have effectively just done a little swap around, and that's a really nice shortcut for solving equations that are of this form. So if you ever have something like a equals b over c, you can swap the a over c around, so, sorry, the, the a and the c around, so c equals b over a. You can do this quick shortcut of swapping those two things around. So we just need to actually finish this part off. It says, what is x equal to? Well, it's 36 divided by 6, and 36 divided by 6 is 6. So we've got our formula in part 1, y is 7.2, and x is 6. OK, I'm going to do one more example, and you're allowed to use a calculator for this. It says that a is inversely proportional to the square of b. So if you wanted to do this, you could say that a is inversely proportional to the square of b. But I'm going to go in with my first line of working, which is just that a equals k over b squared. Now, we always want to find out what k is, even if it doesn't ask us to. It says given that a equals 5 when b equals the square root of 3. So I'm going to replace a with 5, 
and I'm going to replace b with the square root of 3. So it's going to be the square root of 3 squared. Now, if you're going to calculate the square root of 3 squared, we have a calculator. We probably don't need that, though, right? The square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is obviously 3. But seeing as we have a calculator, let's just prove it to you that the square root of 3, when you square it, you do get 3. So this means that 5 equals k divided by 3. All I'm going to do is find out what k is by getting rid of this divide by 3 by multiplying by 3. And 5 times 3 is 15, so k is 15, which means I can rewrite this formula that I have here. And I'm going to rewrite that formula knowing that k is 15. So a is 15 over b squared. It wants us to find out what is the value of b when a equals 7. So it says now that a is equal to 7. Let's find out what b is. I'm going to replace the a that we have here with a 7. So 7 equals 15 over b squared. Now, I talked about this on that previous bit, didn't I? I said that if you have an equation that looks like this, these two are just allowed to swap places. That's because I'm multiplying up by the b squared and then dividing by the 7. So b squared is equal to 15 divided by 7. And they want us to find out what the value of b is. So if I just quickly do a last line of working, b, the opposite of squaring something, to find out what b is by itself, is to square root something. So I'm going to do the square root of 15 over 7. Now if I do the square root of 15 over 7, we get 1.46. It should say to two decimal places. I'm going to say it to two decimal places. So I'm going to say that b is 1.46. Now, technically, when we're taking these square roots, we could have the positive and we could have the negative. But just for the sake of this question, I'm just going to say that b is a positive number. Maybe the calculator, maybe the question would say something like this, where they would say b is greater than zero, meaning that when you're taking the square root, you'd take the positive one rather than the negative one. But I'm just sort of giving you the, the, the theme of what's going on in these. So you're going to do these two questions. I'm going to pause the video and have a go. And then in the next video, I will actually in this video as well, I will very quickly talk to you about the graphs. So it says that y is inversely proportional to x. So I'm immediately going to say that y equals k over x. And when x equals 2, y equals 6. So 6 is equal to k over 2. I'll find out what k is by multiplying the 6 and the 2, which gives me 12, meaning that I know the formula is y equals 12 over x. So there is my formula for y in terms of x. We're now going to find the value of x when y equals 3. So if y equals 3, we would get 3 equals 12 over x. We can do that little bit I said before of swapping those places around, multiplying by x and dividing by 3. So x equals 12 divided by 3, which is 4. So we're looking for the answer of 4. This one says that c is inversely proportional to the square root of d. In other words, c is inversely proportional to the, oops, the square root of d. But I'm going to write my first line as c equals k over the square root of d. It says when c equals 3, d equals 16. So when c equals 3, d equals 16. Now the square root of 16 is 4. So this is 3 equals k over 4, and 3 times 4 is 12, so k is equal to 12. Now that means I know that the formula is now that c equals 12 over the square root of d. And they want us to find out what c is when d is 100. So if d is 100, I get 12 over the square root of 100, and the square root of 100 is 10, so it's just 12 divided by 10, and 12 divided by 10 is 1.2. Now, as always, I put in the link of the, the description um, more questions like this. So I've got some worksheets that I've linked to. So if you want to go and practice them, you definitely, definitely should do. Last thing I'm going to say on this is about these graphs already, but here is a summary. So we talked about if we had a direct proportion graph, it was a straight line. If it was an inverse proportion, like the car and the time, we said it was this kind of shape that looks like this. If something was um, proportional to the square of something, you get this kind of square graph. This looks like a quadratic graph. And if it was like a square root kind of graph, you'd get something that looks like this. This is the same for square root and cube root. And actually, this is what squared and cubed sort of look, this sort of general kind of curve. This one that I've got down here, this one is an example of something that is not any of these things. So note, this graph 
does not represent direct proportion. Direct proportion is the one that I've got in the top left um, with the red line. The reason this doesn't represent it is because it must go through the origin. So it must go through the origin for direct proportion. It must go through the origin is 0, 0 for direct proportion. And that goes right back to what I said on the very, very first page of this, which is the fact that if one of the things is 0, the other thing must be 0 as well. So if one of the quantities is 0, so must the other be. Like this kind of thing, not going to be direct proportion because it's not going to be 0 for both of them. So watch out for that because that's something they like to ask about. I'll do one final video on this where I will discuss three exam questions because, as usual, the exam questions are, are a little bit trickier than what I've covered here. Found this video helpful? Then why not drop it a like and consider subscribing to my channel. If you'd like the next video in the playlist, you can click here to be taken straight to it. And as always, wishing you the very best for all your studies.